co-chair of the Indigenous Health Dialogue and Indigenous Health Program Director. He's a member of the Pecani Nation Treaty 7 region of Alberta, an associate professor in the Department of Family Medicine and member of the O'Brien Institute for Public Health at the CSM. Dr. Pamela Roach is Director, Indigenous Health Education, a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta and originally from the historic Métis community of Saint Laurent, Manitoba. She's an assistant professor in the Departments of Family Medicine and Community Health Sciences and a member of the O'Brien Institute, the Hotchkiss Brain Institute, and the Matheson Center for Mental Health Research and Education. Holly Logan is a member of the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. She is the Indigenous Health Program Coordinator, has over six years experience working at the university with various Indigenous initiatives. I think most of you know uh, Lindsay Marcaccio, who's a communicator with the office, and she attends all these meetings with us. So Lindsay Marcaccio, over to you. Great, thanks Kyle. Um, so I'm just gonna start sharing my screen. And as well, I'd like to introduce Kate Dunn. Uh, we weren't sure Kate was going to make it today, but she has just recently joined our team as the Indigenous Research Associate. And so Kate is also part of making great things happening here within the Indigenous Health Program. Um, the reason why we are presenting today is just to let everybody know what our role is. I know many people are like, hmm, what does the Indigenous Local and Global Health Office do? So part of this is to introduce what the Indigenous Health um, portfolio of the office does and to let you guys meet the awesome people that I get to work with who are really working hard to advance um, Indigenous health outcomes and teaching and learning capacity within the coming School of Medicine. So this is just a little bit of an information session uh, with an opportunity for a Q&A at the end. And I will have a handout that Kyle is going to email to everyone so you have kind of a resource at your fingertips. And so I'll take it to um, Dr. Roach and she can start. We do have a slideshow, so it'll just act as a lovely prompt for all of us who are speaking today. So thanks, Dr. Roach. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, and thanks everybody for having us here. I see a few folks that I know. Um, so it's good to be able to see you sort of all in the same place uh, and really appreciate the opportunity just to kind of come tell you a little bit about what we're up to. I think the Indigenous Local and Global Health Office, we went through sort of a renaming, right? So it used to be space, um, which I think was probably even more ambiguous. And I think people were like, I don't know what the space office does. Um, so we tried to actually just put it in the title. This is exactly what we do. Um, so happy to be here. I think a lot of you know me from uh, when I was not in a, in a full faculty position. Um, so I started that about a year ago and then in May was appointed Director of Indigenous Health Education for the school. Um, so sort of formalizing my position within the office. Uh, and really what we do um, is a lot of different things but trying to, to advance Indigenous health outcomes. And so some of that links through to teaching and education and the way um, I, I tend to frame it as Indigenous health system safety. So we're looking at improving individual and population level health outcomes by connecting to the kinds of education that we provide here in the school, everything from UME to graduate studies to continuing medical education, faculty development, um, and working hard uh, to, to make progress and, and push forward reconciliation within the med school. So I think we've already Introduce most of us here. I'm, I'm sure Lindsay Crowshoe will be joining us, um, but he's often back to back in meetings and kind of trying to get in between places. Um, and then I guess the other person who's not here is, is Dr. Mosher. So Diane Mosher is the associate dean for the office. So she's the, the associate dean um, and is the, the primary sort of point of contact. And then depending on which part of the office you want to talk to, you kind of get directed. Um, and I guess what we wanted to, especially because this is a room of, of folks who are in communications um, and who can help us get the message across is that there's been so much work uh, going on, uh, particularly in the last sort of 12 to 18 months around equity, diversity and inclusion initiatives and anti-racism task forces. I know I myself, I'm on, I feel like I'm on every committee going um, around health equity these days. But I think what's kind of happened is that sometimes there's everybody's so eager to, to do all this good work, 
um, that there can sometimes be some unintended consequences or because there's been a bit of a name change that people don't exactly know who we are or where we are or what we do. Um, so we really want to sort of put out this message that, you know, even the, the best intended initiatives, um, if especially around Indigenous health or anything to do with Indigenous people, uh, are are not, um, if, if the ILGH office or Indigenous folks aren't really engaged in that work, it can sometimes have unintended consequences when it goes a bit sideways. So what we'd like to do is really encourage, you know, if there's different units or teams or programs or, you know, courses that are trying to develop curriculum or engage in research um, or want to, to host some events um, that they, you know, reach out to the ILGH office, get in touch with the Indigenous Health Program. So Holly is there. She has her own email account. She also fields all of the emails that come through. Um, I think it says AB Health, right? So it's when it used to be called Aboriginal Health. Um, so she fields all of those emails. We have Kate who receives a lot of a lot of communications and then can get them to the right person. So sometimes that's Diane, sometimes that's me, sometimes it's Lindsay Koshu, sometimes it's Lindsay Marcaccio, um, or sometimes it might be Kate or Holly uh, or anyone else. And so it gets you to the right person. Um, but we would, you know, much rather have people reach out to us and and engage in these ways to to help further their own work. Um, and we can help. Sometimes it's think it's just like really little things, like you know, we've done this a million times. We've we've developed new cases for teaching a million times. This is how they sometimes go wrong, and we can help you plan for that. So that's the kind of messaging really that we like to um, have out there and, and that the Indigenous Local and Global Health Office has the knowledge, the resources, the experience and the Indigenous leadership to ensure that things are done in a good way with transparency, trust, integrity and reconciliation at the core. Um, just because a lot of times that the concepts around reconciliation around Indigenous health, especially when we think of like structurally, legislatively, are a bit different than the broader EDI concepts, which are largely Western constructs anyway. So just kind of want to put that messaging out there that there's a little bit of nuance there that we sometimes need to think about. We have lots of resources um, on the ILGH website. We have the Indigenous Health Dialogue. So that was a huge piece of work where we had elders um, come, come to campus uh, and there was a lot of like many days worth of work to really examine the TRC, each of those health related calls to action and what that means for the med school. And so there's a set of, of directions um, within the health dialogue that are on the website that relate to research and service and teaching and leadership and inclusion and all of those aspects of the School of Medicine um, and what that means. So that's a really amazing resource for people within the school to be able to go to, to look for direction. It comes along with a critical reflective framework and recommendations for a path forward. So those are everything from hiring due to, through to like, you know, how do we form committees? How do we structure teaching? Um, and so all of those, those directions are there. And there's, uh, I think a recording, we've done one fireside chat about the Indigenous Health Dialogue so far. So there was Dr. Kroshu, myself, Dr. Henderson um, from Family Medicine and a few other folks where we kind of sat around and, and talked about it virtually um, and had some breakout groups and talked about what this meant for people's work, right? So lots of good resources there. Um, the Indigenous Health Program and obviously Holly is our new coordinator. So um, really making some great strides there to engage the learners. So beyond just the UME Indigenous learners, we've got Indigenous residents and undergraduate students and graduate science students and residents and fellows. And so trying to really engage everybody, create a sense of community, and also figure out all of those extra pieces around admissions, um, around support for students once they're here, uh, around curriculum, um, there's some new federal funding that was announced back in, I think it was January or February, um, as a result of a bunch of federal meetings after the death of Joyce Eshaquan. So the federal government has directed funding, not only for health services, but also for a national consortium of Indigenous medical education. So that is getting up and running. They have an executive director, they're forming working groups, and those working groups are going to provide national frameworks for everything from you know, support and promotion and admissions to curriculum, to assessment. And so 
there's going to be a lot of work going on on that side of things. Um, and that's going to be all connected to the Indigenous Health Program. We have uh, traditional knowledge keepers and residents funded by an Atapato grant, grant from main campus from Michael Hart's office. So we have um, you know, elders and residents in the med school that we can connect to. So if we need guidance, um, if you know, people are working on something and they need some connections to community or want to engage with elders or, or wanting to host an event and might like to invite an elder to come do that, um, Holly is a great connection there too, who can connect you. And we have you know, connection circles every second Friday for indigenous um, people within the med school. Um, and then the Indigenous Research Support Team, which is a, an initiative from main campus, uh, but we have a dedicated sort of research support person for the health uh, faculty. So medicine, nursing, and kinesiology, and that's Shayla Scott. And so the Indigenous Research Support Team are there to function as a support for Indigenous faculty and investigators. So if we need help, we need an extra set of eyes on a grant, application or we need somebody to set up our ethics um, just because indigenous faculty because there's so very few of us um, get called on to do a lot of service work uh, when we're still sort of trying to meet all of the regular demands that most research faculty have so they can help us with some of those tasks but the other thing that they do that's really great is supporting non-indigenous faculty connect uh, and connecting to communities or sometimes they'll have a, a community organization approach them with an idea, like they have an identified need um, in community. And so they'll approach the, the Indigenous Research Support Team and actually say, you know, we have this great idea, who might, do you know of anyone at the university who might uh, be a researcher who's in this area? So they can kind of match make people as well, which is a great resource. And they direct people to appropriate training and all those kinds of things. I see Lindy, Lindsay's joined. <laughs> I'm talking Lindsay um, a lot. Uh, so, if you want to jump in, please feel free. But I'm just trying to run through a little bit of the, the things that we do. Um, an existential road bump. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the Indigenous Health Dialogue and the process that was undertaken there. Um, we've talked about the office, but maybe I'll hand over to you if you want to do an intro. And then I can either keep going or you can feel free to take over. I don't mind either way. Uh, sure. I'll, um, I'll start with an intro. Thanks, Pam. Sorry I'm late. Um, I don't know how often that happens to, to you when you're down the research path and you're like, hey, what we just did is was what we just went down the a pathway that was not the pathway we were intending and we had to like make some sense of it. So and uh, anyway, so that's where I was at. So sorry I'm late. Uh, they're still meeting, working through it. Um, my name is Lindsay Croshu, and I'm a family doctor and a uh, researcher here at the school, um, uh, associate professor in family medicine and assistant dean in the Indigenous Local Global Health Office. I'm from the Pagani Nation, which is one of the Blackfoot tribes, and um, I've been here for quite a while as a uh, filling this role. Um, um, I was brought on during the time of uh, there was an accreditation um, issue and they asked me to help to support uh, creating an Indigenous um, policy uh, uh, for Indigenous inclusion, Indigenous student admissions and a program and a process. And uh, that's what I that's what I helped out with. Um, and uh, over the course that we developed the Indigenous health program um, prior to what we see here, um, uh, it was all focused in Indigenous, uh, in, in the undergrad medical education area. We had a host of, of, of uh, responsibilities around education, around uh, students, Indigenous student admissions and Indigenous student supports while we were there. Um, and in ambitions, we talked about the idea that, that we, we wanted to build the competitiveness of Indigenous peoples to come into our school as students. Um, uh, and we had a host of, of, of and still have a host of activities that achieve that. Um, we also had this idea that we wanted to build sort of capacity within our school broadly outside of undergrad medical education, which we also always felt it was um, outside of the scope of what an Indigenous health program in, an, in, an, in the ind undergrad medical education office. So uh, that's, um, that's some of the back background 
and sounds like Pam uh, chatted about as we were moving forward with the emergence of the Global Health Office and the Truth and Reconciliation, we envisioned uh, a broader scope of Indigenous health outside of undergrad medical education and, um, and, uh, and started to conceptualize um, possibilities. Um, there, there was, uh, there's always been institutional sort of uh, issues around achieving that, um, all, always around uh, not enough money in the budget, so this is not a priority and all that kind of stuff. But um, with, uh, with the help of first the Global Health Office and now this, uh, in renaming it to the Indigenous Local and Global Health Office, Indigenous Health has had a, um, has had a, a, a broader portfolio and expansion of that. Uh, to 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 include that last item that I said was part of the um, part of the uh, uh, undergrad medical education, and in saying that I can speak to this slide, um, in in building a broader um, a broader capacity uh, around Indigenous health uh, within our school, um, which uh, which means many things. Um, this first um, project is around around the, the nature of art and uh, symbolism and um, the role it has in, in uh, supporting our institution to, to, to engage and, uh, and, and facilitate the idea of inclusion. And inclusion is not just indigenous peoples, although that's important. And inclusion is the inclusion of of indigenous concepts and indigenous experiences and indigenous ways of knowing into our school. And art is one of those ways to help to support that, the symbolism of, of art and its complexity um, as, a, as a place for us to stop, think, uh, have conversations and chat. So that's what we're building right now. And we're currently in the process of, of uh, with, with funding that we received from, um, from outside of the medical school, um, we have a curator and enough funding to to do a, an engaged, a community engaged process to to building a a, a, paint, a, a mural um, in the one the atrium where the Hippocrates statue is above on the wall. So that's pretty cool. That's that's happening right now, and we'll be we will be. Um, we we have a host of individuals that have uh, have come forward to provide a. Uh, uh, in this competition to find uh, an uh, artist and uh, a mentor and a mentee artists uh, group to like um, start building this this art. So we will uh, adjudicate very soon. Um, the second initiative was the this educational aspect, um, which I think is a, a big part of Indigenous education. How do we build capacity for doing a great job uh, uh, regarding Indigenous health education for uh, for people, whether it's um, undergrad medical education all the way to PGME to to uh, to PGM to uh, to graduate training and to um, faculty development, um, how do we do a a, uh, a a the best job that we could to achieve the outcomes that ought to happen where we are uh, facilitators of better outcomes and not complicit in the processes of colonization and racism and all that kind of stuff. This one in particular is focused on how do we work in the world of uh, supporting those who have trauma because of historical issues from residential schools or other types of adverse life experiences coming from colonization that has created uh, trauma. How do we help and work with the indigenous peoples and what is the knowledge and what, are the, what is the training that we ought to have in order to achieve that? And this is a self internal funded uh, project that we will be facilitating and that it's on the go. We've actually had a, um, the, been framing its, uh, its, uh, its um, conceptualization and the initiatives and the way that we will be doing it um, that will all include some seed grants to help uh, people to build their their um, educational aspects and and a community of practice approach to support those in doing so um, so that uh, what we uh, develop can be learned and shared across our institution as best as possible with the the, the funding that we've received. Um, we also are in interested in the Indigenous Local Global Health Office to do do community based work, right? And um, this last item is uh, is a uh, is some funding that we have from ACRI, and the idea here is that um, that uh, 
working with um, young people and understanding those factors, those contexts, um, having a, a, a literacy around these things that, um, that create toxic stress in, uh, in our lives as Indigenous peoples. At a young point, how do we best share that knowledge and support young people in accessing that knowledge that helps to helps them to helps them to be empowered to 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 uh, to have uh, different trajectories in life? So having knowledge and being empowered and finding spaces and places for for uh, for utilizing this knowledge to to be well um, to interrupt those factors that create toxic stress. Um, so this is a uh, knowledge and how knowledge can be empowering and knowledge is a social determinant of health. Um, and, um, so this project is about building a, is the fundamental building blocks of the, the, uh, of the, the evidence base and the methods that we need to build towards the, the initiative. Um, I'm gonna pass it over to, uh, to Pam, I think for this next slide. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, these are just also a few things that, that we're connected to. So maybe not everything is directly situated or funded by ILGH, but certainly work that's connected to the kinds of things that we do. So some of these projects um, are around you know, redefining professionalism when we think about um, competencies and, and the way we're educating learners across the school and, and where we fit things like anti-racism and Indigenous health into the, the competencies and, and the way we train folks. Um, so, you know, working with people in the community who are more likely to experience harm within the healthcare system. Um, we're also looking at the bias, um, that, so explicit and implicit bias, anti-Indigenous bias that, that medical school applicants actually um, have at the point of application to medical school. So we're gonna be doing this in a longitudinal way, but the results so far um, are fairly promising in that at some point between application and, and actually admission and taking up a place, um, it, that on average, there's less bias in those that students that are admitted than in the general applicant pool and less than in, a, in another general pool from main campus. Um, and so what we're trying to do there is Sort of set a baseline of, of, you know, who are we admitting to the medical school? Um, what steps do we need to take in the admissions process? Uh, and then also, like, you know, what happens when people are, are in the school and we are educating them? So maybe then building these kinds of assessments in later, you know, at transition to clerkship or graduation from the MD program um, and to help us inform education there. So there's a few different initiatives. And then also, you know, including, as I mentioned, all these different parts of the education system, uh, including faculty development. So also as we think about developing curriculum and, and we see this certainly when we want to run more sessions around health equity and social justice and EDI and reconciliation, um, is supporting faculty to be able to do those things and to build those that capacity to facilitate this training. So um, there was, I got a grant from the Taylor Institute to develop this faculty development program. So it's part of the PLUS program in the Office of Faculty Development and Performance around practical leadership for university scholars, um, specifically situated around Indigenous health and specifically uh, to encourage people in senior leadership positions to be able to create change within their sphere of influence. So really, you know, giving people a lot of core understanding of, of the historical inequities, of current day inequities, um, and also how those play out in the systems that they operate in. So that's, you know, the health system, the education system, post-secondary, wherever they are, and being able to see systems changes that they can start facilitating and, and making decisions on. Um, so we've run that twice. The third cohort actually starts tomorrow. Uh, and it's a four, four days, four half days, because we're doing it on Zoom. So we don't want to keep people on Zoom for, you know, a couple of full days. <laughs> and just nobody's attention uh, can take that. So we're doing that um, really to, to get people who can influence policy change um, and, and more of those systems operational changes to be able to go ahead and, and feel confident uh, in that work. So those are just a few of the, the big picture kind of projects um, that I think are connected to ILGH. Oh, great. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Roach and um,
And just before we flip to the question part of the presentation, I just want, I wanted to invite Holly and Kate, if you're both still on the call, just to um, unmute and say hi so people can uh, see your face and um, do a little bit of an introduction there. Sure. So my name is Holliston, but I do go by Holly for short. And as was mentioned, I'm the Indigenous Health Program Coordinator. And so if you need to reach out to me at any time, you can connect to me through my personal email, but I also am the one monitoring the AB Health inbox. Thanks, Holly. Kate, are you still on the call? Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Kate Dunn, and I'm just joined the team here a couple of weeks ago. Um, I'm um, Anishinaabe from Ontario, but been here in uh, Calgary for a few years. And I will be working with the team on a couple of the projects, the Pathways to Healing and the Interrupting Toxic Stress. Good to meet everybody. Thanks, Kate. 